to order at 5.33 p.m. Thank you all for coming. Happy February to you. Um, with the arrival of one more person, we will then uh, address the January minutes. Um, until then, Keith. And good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. That wasn't very convincing. <laughs> Come good on. Evening. Evening. Come on, it's Monday. Right. And it's hard to believe it's a year that has passed when we had one of the most horrific events. And so this week we have been really gearing up. You've probably seen some of the media play around the anniversary of Stoneman Douglas. Um, we're in the midst of the uh, 17 Acts of Kindness campaign. A lot of just amazing good that has come out of something so horrific in our schools. Uh, all of our schools have been uh, participating in some type of campaign one way or the other. Um, of course, um, first and foremost, we've been talk working particularly with the secondary schools on Thursday is to really be prepared just for safety and just uh, obviously we do that every single day, but um, <clears throat> in particular this day that we're just, you know, everybody's on their game and uh, just ensuring a very smooth, calm day with what other celebrations or recognitions um, that they are doing. So <clears throat> we have asked our schools to participate in a moment of silence at 1017. Um, Superintendent uh, Runcy asked uh, all the superintendents throughout Florida to, you know, stand with Stoneman Douglas for a moment of silence at that time. So that has been a big piece that we've been working on and just really following up with um, at this particular moment. Also, if you watched last week's board meeting, um, right now um, with the passing of the referendum, we've got a number of things that we've been working on and probably what we'll bring forward um, next month or in the near future, just about the expansion of what we're working on when it comes to the, uh, in particular, the quarter mill that's around school safety. I know Chief, Chief Kitcher will be here in a little bit. He's got some things that he's working around on our side of the academic side of the house, really about how we're expanding our mental health um, dollars and how we plan on doing that. So we have the Stoneman Douglas Act that I think we went over in this and how we were spending those dollars, um, where we bought, we purchased a, a, a crisis team, we call it CAPE, uh, a crisis, uh, crisis assessment prevention evaluation team. So if there's a particular threat that's happening on a campus, we're able to deploy some teams of mental health professionals to address particular issues on a campus immediately. So these particular two teams, and just to give you some numbers, this, is, this plan was turned around over the summer, got the, this particular team staffed up probably in November, and already we've had about 185 referrals from schools where they're calling these teams for additional assistance and follow-up. In addition, the majority of the dollars were spent on expanding those behavioral health agreements that we have with our agencies to provide school-based, what we call co-located services on our campuses. We're currently on 60 campus, uh, 60 schools um, throughout the county, spread geographically throughout. Um, just got the updated numbers. We've had almost 1,500 referrals to these agencies um, from our partners that, at, at these 60 schools. Unbelievable that, you know, people always talk about stigma and things like that and they're worried. Um, what we do know is when the access is close to kids and families that they're gonna utilize those services. So we're excited with the referendum dollars that we'll be able to expand what is happening um, on our school campuses with these co-located services. These are the agencies that to do the really deeper end work which is not particularly the primary business that we're in here as a school district. So um, very excited to see that the, these services are being utilized and these dollars have been well spent. Um, <clears throat> so that's a little bit, a lot about what's going on here. Also, you may have heard um, that the governor has put out a number of different um, executive orders. Most recently that impacts us is really around uh, standards. And in particular, the call to do away with common core standards, um, which a lot of the Florida standards 
are embedded with Common Core standards. You kind of all know, for the most part, the history that we went through here in Florida. I've been at a good place. So what he's actually asked for that in a, basically a year from now, that the uh, Commissioner of Education will present um, a set of new standards to the legislation um, based on input of teachers, parents, community, um, and everybody in between. So that's a tall order to get done in one year to pull together uh, standards that he feels that would lead the nation and um, as far as uh, rigorous, high and demanding standards, uh, but to get rid of the Common Core. So therefore, uh, that puts us in particular a uh, couple issues that we have going on. We have two major adoptions, textbook adoptions that we're going through. Um, we have currently ready to, for board approval, which now more than likely would probably put on hold or some kind of variation for the math adoption. Um, uh, Obviously, these are our two most expensive adoptions, math and literacy. So uh, there is rumor that the governor will be doing another executive order or a press conference of some sort talk to about textbook adoptions because there's a lot of questions. You've probably seen some of the media. Um, some of the other districts have come out strong saying one way or the other they're going to hold off or they're going to, you know, they want more clarification from the DOE. Um, we all want more answers. It's right now it's clear as mud. So we personally, you know, myself, Diana Fetterman, have working closely with our vendors. Pearson has a majority of the math adoption to work on some type of compromise that's fiscally responsible, but yet also puts the best materials in front of our kids. Um, we haven't, I think, uh, for our board to support, um, we're not probably at a place of agreement. So, but yeah, we want to see what's going to continue to come out um, from the governor in the next couple of days if you, something comes out, as well as any clarification that comes from the Department of Education. Um, you know, at, at minimum, the company has agreed to rewrite the materials and things like that, but um, there's a lot of unknowns. So um, that's a big uh, uh, issue that we're faced. With literacy, more than likely, Chief, you can come down sit next to me. <laughs> um, you need to put a PowerPoint in, is that okay? Yeah, right up here. Are you loaded? You want me to move? No, I have it right here. Oh, okay. When it comes to literacy, um, the DOE has pretty much come out already that more than likely the literacy adoption will be delayed. So instead of starting that process next year, um, I know a number of you here have been involved in that process. Um, as we're you know refining our rubric for evaluation. Um, more than likely, um, we'll have more time to refine it and make sure it's even better. So, um, so keep your saying it'll be, I, I'm on that committee, um, that the adoption will be delayed and for another year. Is that what you're saying? At least an additional year, if not more. Um, but again, everything's changing kind of daily on this piece, so I'll have to probably bring an update again next month. But more than likely, at least for one year, if not more. Um, also, if the governor does come out and says that the math adoption is delayed, then obviously that backs up everything. Uh, so we'll have to see uh, what direction they bring forward. Um, as far as the development of new standards, there's already a number of committees that have been put together to from the governor's side. Um, <clears throat> we're waiting to hear if uh, whatever district staff will be asked to be part of that as well. Is that textbook delay related to the changes that the governor's putting with this, that he's asking everyone to put together for the standards? Is that what that, the reason for that, the textbook delay? Correct. Because right now, the, all the textbooks that are proposed are based off the current adopted standards. Right, right. So all that kind of goes out the window. So the textbook companies are kind of in a tailspin also. Okay. Keith, do we know whether the uh, new standards, whatever they are a year from now, will they be confined to verbal and quantitative skills? We have no clue. He wants to, he wants to get a lot of input from, but I have no idea where this is going. 
Are there other states that are looking at changing their standards as well? Not that, um, not that I've heard, but this, he, you know, a lot of what he, you know, he's coming through on a campaign promise. Mm -hmm. You know, he heard from certain communities that they were concerned about our standards, that they were common core. We had some of that here locally as well, um, concerned around the standards. Since so. the um, college entrance exams are aligned with common core, I guess that's all up in the air too. Yeah, and maybe through the process, there'll be some misconceptions cleared up that mm -hmm. maybe there won't be that much variance, but I, mm -hmm. I, I, I really, this is a different playbook and I don't, <laughs> I don't have the playbook, have I have the rules or, so. Has there been any discussion about um, what they look to put in place to bridge the difference between old standards and new standards? whatever those new standards might be? No, I think that's going to be one of the big pieces. So even if they, in a year from now, the commissioner does have a set of standards that he's going to bring forward to the legislation, is then what does that rollout plan look like? When these current standards that we're under, there was a number of years to onboard teachers, professional development. Um, those are all a lot of unknown questions. Um, which usually, ideally, would take multiple years to to transition. It's, it's, it's big when you transition standards, so uh, it's significant. So our biggest concern was around textbook adoption and what we do in the midst. So, and mm -hmm. then potentially if we are staying with the current standards, our math, our current math books are not aligned to these standards because of the changes just a few years ago. Um, and we were hoping to be able to, to fix that particular issue. Right now, we do a lot of supplement for teachers to, to bridge those holes and those gaps. So we may be in that situation where we continue that in the meantime. But I can tell you I don't have any answers. Just a lot of questions, as most of you do. And I'm assuming there's also a discussion that since they're changing the standards, they're going to be changing the Florida standards assessments? Yeah, I think one of the positives that we're seeing out of this, which is a really good thing, he's come out very publicly about trying to reduce testing. Um, the concern that we're over testing kids and the high stakes yes. to these tests. So this is uh, a piece that could come out that's a, a, a good thing for our kids. So we all believe in that assessing accountability is important, but let's have that in balance. So that does come along with that as well. So good. Yeah, that's good. Forgot to mention that. Carlos. Just one question. Uh, has anybody calculated how many hours a year the average Palm Beach County student spends in prepping for or taking standardized tests? Some have tried to quantify it, and it's pretty extensive. Is but it? I tried to stay hopeful, <laughs> stay on the positive. But so going along with that, so there are a variety of types of diagnostic tests that are done, right? There are the ones that are labeled as diagnostic, can't speak tonight, sorry. Diagnostic tests, there's the Palm Beach Performance Assessments, which are the writing tests, right? And then there are the USAs, and there's something else that starts with an F. FSQs. FSQs. Those are diagnostic tests, or those are not diagnostic Those are tests? more uh, formative, informational, uh, short, quizzes or small, uh, in, a, in less than a period sitting to do an assessment based on a particular unit or based on a particular standards that were being taught to do, assess mastery. Okay, so do those tests, those are developed by the district or by the teachers? Uh, a combination, mostly by the district. Uh, a lot of them have been through a vendor that are you know, aligned to the standards aligned to the state's um, particular uh, test spe specifications. And, so. and do those only cover material that's been covered in the class, or do they also have questions about future material? They align with our scope and sequence, so based okay. on what was taught. Great. But uh, Chief is here, so I don't know if we could 
we can transition to yes. save time. I Just did have another question. That would be okay. all right. Um, the article that was in the newspaper a few weeks ago regarding teacher evaluations. Okay. Um, can you kind of like give us an update on what the district is doing as a result of that kind of uh, situation? I think the data was all taken from um, from, Chris, uh, from district uh, information. Yeah, can we do that at the end just because I know sure. that we could go down a rabbit hole there. Okay. Um, there's not an easy, <laughs> there's a lot there. And yeah, that's fine. I thought this would be the good setting, the appropriate setting to bring it up. But sure, after well, you're done. Let's let Chief go through his presentation, then when he's done, he can right. go ahead and get out and get ready for a busy week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know if maybe, uh, Laura, if we could just quickly do introductions so Chief knows who, who we are, who's, who they are, and who, who's, who they represent. Okay, so Sandy, if you'd start, we'll go around that way. All right, uh, Sandy Greenberg from West Boynton. And you represent? Excuse me? You're Karen Brills? Karen Brill. That doesn't, okay. Hi, I'm Nancy Reese. I work in the Department of Safe Schools. I'm representing school counselors. I'm Carlos Diaz, representing the Hispanic Education Coalition. And I'm Jackie Calloway, representing the Coalition for Black Student Achievement. Hi, I'm Laura Fellman. I'm appointed by Marsha Andrews. I'm Helen Zintek, I'm Clay Shaw. Louise Grant, the superintendent. Ellen Van Arsdale, Barbara McQuinn's appointment. Okay. All right, so Chief Kitsuro, many of you know, um, if this is your first time meeting him, uh, you're gonna enjoy hearing him. We're glad to have him on board. From, we stole him from Jupiter, so for those of you who don't know, um, but has gotten a, a tremendous amount of work done in a very short period of time. Chief. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the time here tonight. I'll tell you a little bit about my background. First of all, my name is Frank Kitzero, as you can see right there on the screen. Um, uh, I've been in uh, the law enforcement profession for well over 30 years uh, and uh, spent the majority of my time in the Washington, D.C. area in a place called Fairfax County, Virginia. Um, you know, where I, I worked for that agency most of my career. Uh, when I left, I was a major in command of criminal investigations, so I had organized crime, uh, money laundering, vice narcotics, all the types of things that you could imagine that would keep you busy up there. Became a police chief in a very um, urban setting uh, in Portsmouth, Virginia, where I was there for a few years, and then got recruited to become the police chief in Jupiter where I was for the last 13 years. And uh, somehow or another, I wound up with the school <laughs> district <laughs> about six or seven months ago. And you know, it's only been six or seven months, but I tell Keith sometimes it seems like the longest five years of my life. <laughs> so, um, but it's been a great job. And, and so, uh, you know, we've been doing quite a bit of work, as you can imagine, in light of everything that's happened out there. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through tonight some of the things relating to school safety. I think for the most part, people think it's just about putting a police officer on the campus and you stand up by the bus loop and that's pretty much it. Um, but it's, it's a lot more complex and it's a lot more than that. So um, you already know this about the district. Typically I'll go through this um, when I'm out in the public. But the one thing that's really uh, important here uh, is that we're covering schools across 2,300 square miles in this county. And so to be able to make sure that we have continuity of operations plans, you know, that we're all working together, rowing in the same direction is, is, a, is pretty challenging itself. And not to mention the fact that we have 146 languages uh, spoken. A little bit about the uh, school district police department. We're on our way to 225 sworn law enforcement officers. When I came here uh, almost seven months ago, now um, you know we were in a position to have to hire 75 new officers. Um, I, I think most people thought we couldn't do it. Uh, I just swore in number 64 last week, and I have three more in uh, training this week. So. 67 so we'll we'll make that 75 i think before the end of the school year and then thanks to the referendum that was passed with the 72 uh, percent uh, approval rate that um, we'll be bringing on another 75 or 100 next year to make sure that we can get in to all the schools and do the things that we need to do we are a full service law enforcement agency so a lot of people don't understand that we do everything that every police department does 
um, it, you know, and so uh, our little bit of a twist is that, you know, obviously we work in a school environment. I can tell you from a police chief's perspective, what's really interesting about this job. So when, you, when you're police chief, like in Jupiter, for example, you have to deal with school safety, safety at places of worship, hospitals, you know, traffic issues, crime trends, gangs, all the, here in the school district, we deal with one mission and one mission only and that is to keep our children and faculty safe all day long. In essence, we move a city every morning, move a city onto our campuses, keep them safe all day. Always, I'm always amazed when you look at these numbers. Like uh, when I go to my uh, chief operating officers meetings on Tuesday mornings, you know, we, this district serves over a million meals a year. I think it's like three million and change, somebody told me the other day. And then uh, just the buses, 24 million miles driving the buses. I think by the time you get through a school year, you're probably driven all the way to the moon and back or pretty close. <laughs> so, um, and so we have to also collaborate with 25 municipalities in the sheriff's office um, to make sure we're all doing the things that need to be done. So um, two parts to the school safety. One is being safe and, and feeling safe. So that requires on the uh, uh, high visibility, regular video training and all those things out to the schools. And the one thing that I'm, I'm really very proud of that we, we accomplished in record time, and not every uh, jurisdiction has been able to do this, is that we have a law enforcement officer, at least one, in every single school in, in the Palm Beach County uh, Public School District. And so in some we have more than one, um, you know, but we have at least one in every single school. That's, that was a very, very big undertaking. And when you think about this for just a minute, about the collaboration that had to take place, you know, like for example, you have Boca and Jupiter and Gardens and all those folks in, in our elementary schools helping us to keep those safe. You know, the police chief doesn't just get to say, I'm gonna put an officer in that school for a year. Okay, for a school year. It takes mayors and city councils and city attorneys and it's really quite a collaboration. It's very impressive, uh, you know, that we're able to get that accomplished. And then the whole, the other piece is that we foster is the culture of I am school safety. So one of the things that's really important about security, security and safety are two different things. And so um, one of the things that's really important is we want our students to embrace safety. It shouldn't be a scary thing. And I use this analogy. Most of us have flown on a plane. We get on a plane, we can give the safety briefing, right? You sit in the seat, you put your belt buckle on, put your buckle on, your life jacket's under your seat. You know, if uh, we lose cabin pressure changes, the oxygen mask's gonna fall out. Pull that first, put yours on, put the other person's on. If you have to put your life jacket on, don't I'm practicing for my next job, by the way. I just said. <laughs> <laughs> don't pull the don't pull the tabs until you're outside the door. I mean, we could all give it, right? And, but half the time when you fly on a plane, people aren't even paying attention. But in an emergency, you're gonna fall back to what you're trained on. So right now, we spend a lot of time uh, working within the elementary school and middle school environments to promote this very thought, I am school safety. So what does that mean? When somebody asks me, what is school safety? I'm school safety, you're school safety, you're school safety. I can put a million dollars worth of technology in your school, but if you're gonna leave that door propped open, you just defeated everything I just did. So you have to be in a position where we all own it and willing to step up. So um, it's more than just putting an officer on the campus. So in general, this is the areas that I kind of work in, um, you know, as we look at this as a whole. So we're looking at on the front end, if we can do our job right on the front end, equate this to a bank account. If you can keep making deposits into a bank account, um, you know, you, you got a better uh, chance at, uh, being successful if you have to make a withdrawal. So on the front end, we look at prevention, intervention, and diversion. Um, so hopefully we're keeping these events from even happening. Um, right now you've all heard about those uh, student protect apps, the Florida, Fortify Florida app. We get information from those. I think right now we're managing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80 to 100 of those uh, leads that come in there. And it's one of those few things in life that you have to be perfect at. You have to be 100%, 100% of the time. And uh, that's a pretty tall order. On safety and security, that's the single points of entry. If any of you have been visited a campus recently, you'll see single points of entry. You'll see different types of things there. Some are very visible to you, some will not be. 
okay? Uh, but it, just like it, at a very minimum when you drive onto a campus on the outer perimeter, you should see somebody out there either in a golf cart, small building, at least acknowledging folks when they come on the campus. So, um, so you'll see that. Communication, that's only communication between the law enforcement agencies. This district has a very, very robust communication plan that we are able to uh, leverage in the event of a, an emergency. We contact parents, students, all, you know, whoever we need to contact, we've got them separated into groups so we can get to them very quickly. One of the things that you, you're going to see this, um, maybe before the end of this basketball season, if we're lucky, um, when you go to a school event, you'll definitely see it for football. Um, you can even use your te you can text to a certain number, and it will give you will give you updated security uh, information about the venue that you're in. So uh, again, going along, knowledge is power. Crisis response. We're going to talk about some of these down the road. How do we respond? What are all the um, you know, how does everybody work together? When we had that shooting at uh, Palm Beach uh, Central, I was here maybe two weeks, three weeks, I don't know. <laughs> I don't even think I got my first load of laundry back from the cleaners, that was so new. And that wasn't actually a school shooting, it was, um, you know, two people in the parking lot. But what was very interesting is we had over 250 police units show up that night. And so, you know, what do you do with all these folks? Where are they going? Who coordinates them? All that has to be uh, done. And then this reunification piece, uh, you know, think about this. Now, some of our schools, high schools, have over 3,000 students. So one of our jobs is, as you're working through, a, you know, a catastrophic event, is being able to take the students and match them up with the appropriate uh, parents, guardians, whoever that is. And, uh, and be able to do that in some kind of orderly fashion. And then finally, the recovery phase. So if you have to go through all these things, what does the recovery look like? What does the new normal look like? You know, for example, they're struggling with that down there in uh, Broward at Parkland. And I think just today I heard that they finally, f that they decided what their hours are gonna be in terms of what they're gonna do with the one year anniversary on Thursday. This is always a challenge. Getting to that point is a very, very difficult thing. So uh, I wanted to share this with you to kind of give you an idea of the complexity of school safety. The most visible sign will be an officer on every campus, but there's a lot of things happening in the background. Each one of these has multiple, multiple layers uh, that we're working on and working through right now. So um, I said before that we have one mission and, uh, and one mission only. And so let's see if I can show you what this looks like. Could you hit the enter button on there and see if, uh, I don't, I don't, yeah, there you go. Uh, we don't have speakers? Mark in there? Mark? There you go, that's good. I'm here every day. Palm Beach County School District Police serve students as mentors, teachers, and trusted confidants. Fred! They protect students and staff. Excellent accuracy. You need to pick up the speed on your draw. You need to pick up that speed, folks. By training for scenarios that they're doing everything in their power to prevent. We are going to do everything we can uh, to make sure our students and our teachers and our staff are safe. Nothing else matters. That is our primary goal. We devote uh, a lot of hours to uh, what we call high liability training, whether it's firearms training and qualifications. Defensive tactics involving hand-to-hand -hand type of training. This is just more of a tactic where someone's being violent and they're not complying. You put them in a compliance hold and you can hold on to either help arrives or until you're able to handcuff them. We also uh, spend a lot of time with active shooter scenario type uh, training. Our officers are, are trained to, uh, to move and shoot and be very accurate on what they're shooting at. Our background in, in a shooting scenario could potentially be children, so they have to be they have to be able to shoot their weapons on the move and hit whatever they, whatever they're uh, they're aiming at. School police devote hundreds of hours a year training for emergency situations, but equally important, the countless hours they devote to gaining the trust of students. The firearms, the defensive tactics, the active shooter, that is one extremely important uh, aspect of our training and our, and our role as school district police officers. But another role is to be able to build those relationships with students and staff so that when they hear something, when they have suspicions, 
uh, they can come to us. How do we see when someone's getting out of the They have a computer. Usually, yes, very good. Usually they have a computer. It's almost, it becomes like a, like a family environment. They become part of the campus, uh, and they take ownership of all of those kids. One, two, three. Claudia Shea reporting for the Education Network, keeping you informed. So that kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like, some of the, you know, what the job entails and that kind of stuff. Um, the one thing that's really interesting to me is the relationships that these officers build with the students on their campus. And uh, I don't want it to be lost here uh, of what we're asking our officers to do. We uh, train uh, on a single officer response to an active shooter. And so we model that after the, the training uh, that is conducted at the National uh, um, Law Enforcement Training Set Center for the federal government. And so, you know, we're asking when everything goes wrong and you hit that catastrophic event to move down that hallway by yourself and take care of whatever the challenge is there. That's a, that's a pretty tall order. And so we train very hard for that. You know, one of the things I talked about the, um, the shooting that we had at Palm Beach Central, uh, you know, the uh, the officers that were there working at that stadium that night, the first officer was at the shooting location within seven seconds of, of the shots ringing out. That's pretty darn remarkable. So uh, so it's tall order. We train our people really well, and uh, and I'm confident they'll do the they'll do what needs to be done if that day comes. So uh, teaming up to protect our schools, it is a team. It, we, there's no one that can do it by themselves. Again, we have one law enforcement officer in every school. We do have continuity of operations plans. So with all the jurisdictions, all the police officers, they all check in the same way. There's a way we do business. You know, we've outlined all those things. We've integrated our emergency response plans. We're sharing information and resources. One thing that's really important for you to know that one of the big changes that, have, that, are, uh, that is happening this year is typically school safety plans are built just for the campus itself. Well, uh, we've introduced information sharing and leveraging technology that um, expands our situational awareness. Now the officers in every campus have access to the police records and information for the uh, agencies that are working around them. Uh, all of our um, emergency plans, every school has an emergency plan and it gets uploaded into a secure cloud system. And so uh, right now I'm working with the fire departments, trauma centers, emergency management, um, to, and they're looking at our plans and they're overlaying their responses. And then all the local jurisdictions look at our plans and overlay their responses. So we get a true unified command approach in the event that we have a ma uh, major, uh, you know, catastrophic event at one of our schools. So um, it's a lot of work, it's a work in progress, but you know, the, the excitement and the enthusiasm about everybody working together is really, uh, it's contagious. People want to do the right thing. So every municipality, we talked about this, that has a school in their city provides support. You know, there's a couple of jurisdictions that don't even have schools in their, uh, in their jurisdiction that are helping. Uh, Juno Beach, Lake Clark Shores, they don't have a school in there, but their kids go to school in our county, so in our school system, so they come out and help as well. And slowly but surely, we're working through moving those contract officers out and replacing them with our school-based police officers. So um, that's old, we had 40 new officers there, I told you what we're up to now. Um, and then, as I said, there's a key external partners. This is not just about the police department. This is law enforcement, fire rescue, criminal justice commission, mental health professionals. I'm gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. Police and fire chiefs association, and I coordinate with school safety specialists throughout the state of Florida. Just last week, Dr. Fenoy and I were over on the West Coast at Tampa last Friday. And, um, and so uh, while we were there, we got an opportunity to see what the rest of the state is doing, and I'm telling you, we are so far ahead of what is happening throughout most of this state. Um, and then, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that some of the things that the school board, the school system brings to bear. We got our school board, our superintendent, obviously the school police, finance, human resources, communications, mm -hmm. technology, safe schools, ESE, risk management, principals and staff, after school activity folks. Uh, that's a lot of people around the table that are working to do things right. 
So um, when you get this whole thing done and you have a collaboration and it's working really, really well, this is what it should look like. Now this is, uh, when I show you this video, and I've included this video in this presentation because you're going to hear the folks within the video talking about this collaboration piece. The one thing I want you to know that's really important is no one knew who else was going to be in the video and none of the things, there's no one in this video that compared what they were going to say to anyone else. It was, this is what they felt, this is what they believe in, this is what they're training for. So, uh, could you make that one work? Oh, hold on back. Hit the enter button. It'll work. It's not going to give it to me? It just worked a couple minutes ago. There we go, right there. See it on the yep. bottom? Mm -hmm. And it is a wonderful day every day for all the help that we get from our police officers. This has really been a real challenge to get a, a police officer or a law enforcement officer in 187 schools. This is really a, a combined effort. We have to join forces, and we do, with all of our partners out there, the municipalities. And this is true of the working environment here in Palm Beach County to begin with. We've always had a close relationship with the officers in the school district and our schools. Um, we encourage our officers to get by the schools, um, even when they're on routine patrol. So they've had a close relationship even prior to this endeavor. From the first day of school, we've had um, continual support. So the relationship is going well. They get the opportunity to understand what we do and how we operate and actually just see the kids in a different light. As principal of William T. Dwyer High School, I feel great about it. Not only does it assure that uh, our students are safe, our community is safe, and our faculty and staff is safe with having uh, the outside agency while they're on campus, you develop those working relationships. It takes all of us to work together, and that's exactly what's happening here with the Palm Beach County School District and what needs to continue into the future. <laughs> Marsh Point has been one of those elementary schools that was previously served by one, uh, one school board resource officer who also covered five other elementary schools. But after Stoneman Douglas, certainly um, the, the laws changed and the need for one-on-one -on -one on site police officers every day created a, a real need for our police officers. This is a great opportunity to get to know the kids. It feels, it feels, makes us feel safe too, knowing that somebody is in the schools at all times. They work shoulder to shoulder with the officers. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what uniform they're wearing. All of the police chiefs, the sheriff work together to ensure that we have the appropriate resources to respond to significant emergencies and that we plan together, that we're working towards the future. There's not one organization that can do it by themselves. We all work for the same common goal. So whether I work for school district police, um, Palm Beach Gardens Police Department, Riviera Beach, PBSO, we're all working for the same goal, and that's to keep our, our communities and our cities and our towns safe. So that's really what it looks like. And, you know, th we do this all, every day. I mean, that's just a small little snapshot. And it's just remarkable to me when I go out and see it. I couldn't be any more proud of the people that I work with uh, as, you, as you see this type of thing happening. So uh, one of the things that's really, really important for us, as you can tell from that, is collaboration. Collaboration is absolutely essential. We do quite a bit for information sharing. I told you we had continuity of operations plan planning. We have multidisciplinary multi teams to assess, evaluate, and respond to various threats. It's not just the police. Okay? One thing that, um, that is very, very uh, important that anyone that has been in this profession for a long period of time will know is you're never going to arrest your way out of a problem. It's just not going to happen. You have to affect change, you have to affect the culture, and you have to work hard at it. We have a crisis response and a communications plan that is second to none uh, in this district. Amity and her team are doing amazing work with, with the communications pieces. Our behavioral services unit, we actually pair detectives with mental health workers. And, uh, and so when we get some of these threats that we're looking at here, it's a, it's a holistic, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, Keith runs the, the majority of that operation, and so we actually use our behavioral services unit as a bridge. And from that unit, um, we have detectives working with these mental health people. And in general, the way it works is the police will take a look at the, 
the elements of the crimes and those type of things. And then the mental health people will look at the person involved, you know, safety plans, site visits. We may need to get risk protection orders, you know, uh, you know, wh whatever it takes. And these folks work together every single day. As a matter of fact, before I came in here, um, one of the last things I did was got a briefing on two cases that were working uh, today. And um, it's, you know, it's across so many different boundaries and um, the ones we met on earlier today. Yeah, the ones you met on earlier today. Yep. Yeah, this so, happens on a daily basis and having the sheriff's office right there in those meetings, your department helps deal with issues so much quicker. Yep. So we, you know, so this, that, that's a really great point. And this behavioral services unit um, also works with the other 23 municipalities out there in Palm Beach County as well. So we may be working with Boca, you know, with Chief Alexander down there one minute and the next minute I'm working with, you know, uh, the chief in Jupiter and, or the sheriff. And so um, hey, we, on, an, on average, we'll get, I know this is a broad range, but anywhere from one to 10 threats every single day. So some days are busier than others. And we're watching social media. Um, I won't, I really can't get into how, but I can tell you that um, we know what's being posted and said. And believe me when I tell you, we take action on it pretty quickly. And you know, it's really amazing to me. Even if you tell the kids that, they're still gonna put it on the social media. They can't help themselves, I don't think. So um, we have a threat assessment team in every school. Okay, so from my perspective, we're constantly looking at the high risk, high exposure cases. So at a minimum, the threat assessment team consists of the principal, the school police officer, and the school counselor. Uh, the principal can put whoever they want on that threat assessment team. We uh, work to standardize a, 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 a threat assessment instrument. Uh, that establishes low, medium, high level threats. And it's based on the United States Secret Service threat assessment model and the Department of Virginia Department of Education threat assessment models. These are two really cutting edge, um, you know, uh, organizations. And uh, I don't mind reappropriating what they have and, you know, building a hybrid out of it. Um, and so what we do is every time we get one of these types of things, um, they're required to go through and do the threat assessment worksheet and to sort of figure out where we are with things. That gets it into our system and we track every single one of these. And Keith and his team, as he's talking about from earlier today, they staff uh, these things every week. And so do our behavioral services unit folks, meaning they go in and they talk about all these cases and they make sure they know who's where, what's the latest, what's they're doing, you know, is there any change? and. You know, all this is really, really important because not only do you have to be 100%, 100% of the time, you also have to make sure because of volume, you don't lose any ground as well. So this is really cutting edge. Uh, this, is, this is the future, I think, in law enforcement in so many different ways, um, you know, uh, instead of, again, trying to rest your way out of a problem. So it's a great partnership. I don't know if you want to add anything to that or. Yeah, I, I would just say each case is so unique and and they have so many, uh, they're so complicated and, and it takes a lot of conversation and who has what resource to make sure that kids don't fall between the cracks because it's so easy for that to happen. You know, that's what we saw, you know, with Cruz. And it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and I don't think people realize just the volume that comes in a large district like this that um, it's, but it's been good because we've been really able to service and really ensure that our schools are safe, safer than they've ever been. And we've had some good success stories too. Um, information sharing and daily operations. Um, you know, one of the things we are getting ready to do here, so I told you we're already sharing information with the local uh, municipalities. So if any, has anybody ever here ever watched a cop show, a police show, and they all start out in like the briefing room and the sergeant and lieutenant's up there and telling them their assignments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, we, we don't get to do that. <laughs> you watch a lot of them. <laughs> um, so we don't get to do that. Because we're spread over the 2,300 square miles, our police officers go right to their campuses every morning. So for the first time in the next, I'm hoping to have it ready in the next 30 days, 
uh, certainly before we get to the end of the school year. For the first time, we're going to have the ability to do those daily briefings, and we're going to leverage the platform that we use to share information. And every day, the officer is going to be required to go on, log on. It's uh, the latest information, latest bulletins. It's interactive, so we can do training over it. And uh, and so let's say I'm I'm working in. Uh, Boca and Keith is the officer in Belglade and we have a case that we're working together we can jump right on the system and talk face to face share information and things I'll show you a little bit about what um, what it looks like we're going to be deploying a new computer aided dispatch records management system and uh, it's quite uh, the technology that we're getting ready to leverage here is really uh, quite remarkable so uh, this is generally, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures now to show what things look like. So in general, this is what the uh, information uh, would look like on the uh, information sharing platform to what's happening around them in other police jurisdictions. So it gives them the latest lookouts. You can go right to the fusion center where things are coordinated. It has analytical tools on there. You can enhance your footprint to almost the entire state to get information. Um, and what's really neat about this system is if I'm looking for something in particular relating to a case and I don't see it, I can program the system to say, I'm looking for this. If anyone enters anything similar to this, would you let me know? And as soon as someone does, it'll send me a notification. Hey, you need to check this out. Somebody just put something in there that you might be interested in. So it keeps us out in front. The goal is to try and stay out in front and stay ahead of the game. Uh, you know, you're, much, you're going to be in a lot safer position if you're proactive as opposed to reactive all the time. So this is what the daily briefing sheet will look like. Uh, you can see up top, you can get executive alerts, operations alerts. You can get the, you can participate in discussions. Where you see that police officer on the right-hand side, those are interactive videos and those type of things. So um, that's where we can communicate back and forth and provide training and, you know, and those types. So uh, our crisis response plans are, as I already told you, are pretty robust, very robust, probably some of the most uh, robust plans I've seen, and they have to be. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting uh, here recently, it's getting better, but typically it's hard to get police officers and firefighters or emergency you know, uh, paramedics in the same room cooperating with each other. Sometimes we just don't see the eye to eye, you know, we're like oil and water. Um, but I will tell you that getting in the room with these folks is just really amazing to me now. Um, and a lot of that has gone away. And, and so the plans and things that we're coming up with are really just remarkable. And we all know what the, what's at stake. You know, these are, this is our most valuable resource. And so uh, people are committed to doing that. Um, again, I talked about the crisis communications plan. I talked about the behavioral services unit. That's the uh, detectives with the mental health workers. Obviously, it bridges the gap between law enforcement, Department of Safe Schools, ESE, um, and district-wide intervention and resources. Working with just, if you could imagine doing what you do every day at your job and have to keep 23 other people informed every time there's something significant, uh, it could be a little hectic, don't you think? And so, uh, so the the systems and the processes that we've built in play and that we put in place not only ensures that that communication will take place, but also we build in redundancies that in case I forget somebody or in case I forget to say something, uh, it'll automatically notify, hey, Keith, you might want to pay attention to this over here. Um, and so, uh, so that really helps us along. Um, you know, one of the uh, other things that's really different since the Stoneman Douglas Act came out is this whole business of risk protection orders. So it used to be if we had somebody who would threaten a school or do those types of things, um, that uh, we could Baker Act that person and we can secure their, we their firearms. And then typically within about 72 hours from a Baker Act you're released, and I would be forced as a police chief in Jupiter, for example, to give them back their weapons. And um, there was nothing I could do. I mean, even, I could delay it a day, or, but it really exposed the city to a great deal of civil liability. On the, in the new system now, there's their, uh, what they, call, they have what they call risk protection orders. And that provides us the opportunity to petition the court to say, look, this person is really, really, really a threat. 
And so we don't think that they should have, we want to take their weapons and we should hold on to those firearms until such time as they're deemed to be, you know, uh, capable of handling them and is no longer a, a threat to the schools. So um, that's really a new, uh, a new piece. And then the whole monitoring piece as well, making sure that nobody's fallen through the, uh, the cracks. <clears throat> Uh, those are two really big challenging areas. And, and anytime you have new laws, uh, there's a lot of gray area. And any lawyers in the room? <laughs> okay, lawyers like to do what? They like to argue. And so, uh, so it's constant back and forth. I'll tell you a great story about how this works. So, in, uh, if any of you have been in New York City, that years ago, the NYPD commissioner, uh, when they were first starting to go into community policing, uh, he wanted to try something different. Instead of arresting his way out of the problem, he said, well, you know, like when it dealt with drugs and prostitution, maybe instead of going after those committing the crime, we go after the customers. If we can get the customers out of the way, then the business will fall. So I want to be able to seize their cars, publish their names in the paper. And he had a whole room full of lawyers, and all afternoon they kept going, no, no, no. It was like the land of no. And so, uh, so he leaned over to his aide and he said, and this is a true story, and he said, uh, today I've heard from the no lawyers, tomorrow bring me the yes lawyers. And the next day the yes lawyers came in and lo and behold, they got the program and the crime rates went like this. So we're, we're kind of seeing that with risk protection orders right now and we'll see how it all shakes out, especially with the new legislative session. So this is some of the technology now that we're looking at when I told you we, or we can upload our, um, our plans right into the, uh, to the software system. So anybody responding, let's, this is actually from an event we had down at Florida Atlantic University in Boca, and it was an act, a staged active shooter event. Is that my mark? Uh, <laughs> I hear an alarm. I do too. Okay. Um, this is actually what it looked like down there that day. That's the FAU campus. Um, anybody responding to this event, if this had been an actual emergency, I don't care if there's 100 of them, 100 people responding, we'll have an overview like this. And you can see up top, this is where a lot of things are happening. That's the hot zone. That's where the active shooters were. Casualty, casualty collection points. The warm zone where we're staging the fire department to go in to help us get the injured out. The fire department staging areas, the command post, uh, the the uh, media staging areas. So you can see it's, you know, these scenes can get a little complex. What's important about this is let's say you got, you have a hundred units or so responding. They know where to go, what to do, uh, because they can see the diagram on there. The other thing that this gives us the capability of doing is managing all the different events. You can see that down on the bottom down there. So uh, that's the hot zone right there that we showed you. But let's say I have to do an evacuation of some residents over here goes on my list. If there's cars or people trapped in there, I need to arrange for food, whatever it is, goes on my list and it helps me manage that, that situation. The other, the other thing that we're working on right now, I think that's really remarkable, is this whole business of reunification. So uh, this is a software system that we're looking at that will match up to our uh, SIS software where we know Every day in every classroom, the teacher has an, uh, um, what do they call it, attendance sheet, right? They call it a roster? A roster. And so um, we want to link the information to that roster so that if an emergency happens, that teacher can immediately go to their software system right here and take attendance. So as you look around the room, as you in, think about it now, you're in that room, it's really dark, you're trying to be quiet. I can see this one and this one and this one and this one, I'm taking attendance. And then when they check on a student's name, what we're working on developing now is, I want them to ask a couple of follow-up questions. So I check on Keith Oswald's name. And then right after that, I wanna have another box pop up that says injured, yes, no. If you check yes, uh, I want you to just, I don't need you to do an exam. I just want you to look. We'll train them how to do it. Uh, major, minor, okay? So, um, so that tells me back at the command post a lot of information. 
So let's say, for example, we've got an active shooter and we're in building two and on the second floor and five different rooms are coming back with major injuries. As the first evolution is happening where we're going down and we're eliminating the threat or isolating the threat, I'm getting ready with the fire department and says, hey, building two, second floor, these five classrooms, this is where we have the most injured students, that's where we're going first. That's where we're going to set up our emergency room, that's where we're going to start treating, okay? Takes the guesswork out of it. The other thing this system we're hoping we'll be able to do is it gives us the opportunity to communicate with the teachers in the classroom. I won't be able to get ahead of social media, but I will be able to provide those teachers with information. We have, the, new, the threat has not been neutralized. Stay in your room. If you're in one of those five classrooms, I can start telling you help is on the way. You work with your operations commander and uh, when we go over there and we say, look, how are we gonna do this? Tell the teachers we're gonna knock twice on the door and slide a card, on the, slide our ID card underneath there, okay? And don't open it for anything else. Now I can go back and I can talk to that teacher and say, you're gonna hear two knocks on the door. There's gonna be an ID card slide under there. Don't open that door unless you see that, okay? So it really, it, it uh, gives us greater opportunities to take control of a scene and get them the help that they need. One thing uh, that I will show you here that we're looking and we're gonna use some of the referendum money for. So right now, uh, we don't have a security monitoring center. Uh, what, what I envision here is that um, every school has the capability of uh, electronically locking down their doors, you know, those types of things, camera manipulation, all that kind of stuff. Um, we don't really have anywhere centrally located uh, that can give us a sense of the pulse of the district during the course of the day. And, uh, and so, uh, which is very, very important. If you could imagine, we, we move around, uh, not frequently, but it's not uncommon for us to be moving from code yellow to code reds in different schools. We have 180 schools. And so, um, so we need to make sure that we can, we can monitor everything that's happening. The second thing that we envision will happen out of, and by the way, this is just a rendering. This is not what it looks like. Uh, so the second thing that will happen is in the event of a code red or a catastrophic event, we want to have the ability to take control of the locks and the doors and the cameras, because think about it. Uh, all the people that normally do it are going to be locked down, uh, you know, within that system and won't be able to do what they need to do. So, and then the other thing right now we don't have, and this is another piece that we're building, uh, we do not have a centralized location currently where we can manage a significant incident. And so um, we're in the process of developing that. This is a small emergency operations center. And, uh, and it brings the key players that have to do with operations, planning, logistics, media, all that kind of stuff into one room around the table. You can see from the rendition of the screens on there that you can bring up whatever it is you need to bring up. And just think about this for a second. There's, you know, uh, Dr. Fenoy and Keith Oswald there in the front seats. And, uh, and now they're making informed decisions about things. We're not just at a place where we're just relying on what we're hearing. We're seeing it. You know, if they don't have what they need in front of them to make a decision, we'll have the capability to bring it up and do it. So, uh, so that's one of the things that we're doing. So that's kind of a general overview of where we are with security. Um, I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, it kind of, uh, the main takeaway to this, well, there's a few takeaways that I want to leave with you. Number one is that we're working hard every day uh, to get things done. Number two is we're collaborating with all the key stakeholders that we could, um, that we can identify. Uh, number three, it's an ongoing process and this, you will be doing this for years to come. Um, but you know, the, the biggest thing is that we're going to do whatever it takes to keep our children and our, uh, faculty safe, safe out there every day. So with that, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Yes, Carlos, uh, you mentioned that you could then, once the security operations center is in place, you could remotely then lock or unlock all the doors in the school. Yes. So obviously you're going to have to replace all the locks. Uh, so, so some of them we'll be able to integrate in right now. Uh, we're doing an assessment at the moment to take a look at what we need to do with locks, uh, um, cameras, 
all those types of things. So the answer to your question is yes, a lot of those will have to be replaced. I imagine a lot of the cameras are just fixed in a particular uh, direction, so you'll need to put in a right. camera that can be remotely. So some will, um, you know, we're, we're looking for the, um, for the cameras that can give us the Wi-Fi capabilities, but we're probably gonna move away uh, from the pan, tilt, zoom type things, you know, that can leave a camera locked in a specific position. What we're really looking at right now is with the new technology is a, a fixed 180. Mm -hmm. And so uh, from whatever location you can work that, work at that. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we really have working in our favor right now is that all of our schools have pretty robust Wi-Fi systems. So when you have that with the latest technology, that gives you at least the link to your school. But it, like I say, it's gonna take years, but that's ultimately desired, the desired outcome. And I presume we've learned the lesson of Stoneman Douglas that when the event happened, Coral Springs Police was on one frequency, Broward Sheriff's was on another frequency, and the school police officer was on a third frequency. Yeah. So we have that worked out so that everybody can talk to each other. We do, we do. We've actually had that worked out for several years here. Um, in Palm Beach County, uh, you know, even though there are uh, disparate radio systems, we have talk groups that we can leverage. Um, and so we bridged radio systems together. We test it regularly to make sure it works. Look, the answer, you know, I've been doing this a long time. It's gonna load a system, okay? And uh, everybody says, well, you have to have capacity, capacity. Only one person can talk at a time. So one of the things that we are getting ready to test and the first phase of testing is gonna happen for us this coming, uh, by the end of the week, is we're looking to leverage that Wi-Fi system to enhance our abilities to communicate within, within deep in the school, where typically no, uh, traditional radios don't work as well because you're working off of towers and you know, trying to penetrate thick buildings. So uh, it's a lot of work, but the answer to your question, yes, we can communicate, yes, we plan for that, Yes, we're working that into our unified command, um, and we just got to keep going at it every single day. And you know, it's you do two things, and you got eight more to do, and three, and ten. And but we're committed to doing it. We're going to do what it takes. I'm not going anywhere. Thank you. Okay, Barbara. Um, I'm actually reading a question from um, our PTA president for Palm Beach County, who couldn't be here tonight, but she is a member, and she asked the question. Um, she has two questions. You've answered one. Um, has Chief filled all of the school district police? Um, I have for Chief is have all the schools been filled with school district police officers? And the answer is not yet. Not we yet. have a police officer at every school. But our second question is what measures are in place to tackle the increase of firearms found in campus in Palm Beach County schools since MSD? So that's really a good question. I just wound up speaking to the Post about this last week. Um, and so, you know, let's take a look at this. You know, we, we want to say there's an increase in firearms and those type of things. Um, you know, when you put a police officer in every single school or you put a police officer on every street corner, um, that's some things are going to happen. Number one, they're going to start developing strong relationships with those around them. Number two, they're probably going to get information. Number three, they're probably going to see things a lot more and uh, they're going to be in a position to take action and, and people are going to come tell them about stuff. And so, uh, um, you know, the, in terms of the numbers, the numbers are up a little bit, but the good news is that the things that we're doing are working. I've just told you about the things that I can talk about publicly. The things that we're doing are working. And every, I can tell you right now, without exception, we have the ability in every single school to uh, be able to determine if someone has a firearm in them. Hmm. So. And just to add to that, the, the day we found two guns, um, Boynton Beach Police Department, or Boynton Beach High School, I happened to be there that day, but it was a girl from another school that turned it into their school because they told them about it, that they saw it at the bus stop, with a high level of trust, um, which we were able to lock that school down till those were located. It was a oh. long morning, but we were able to. A long day. <laughs> it was a long day. Yeah. Nika? Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for all of the hard work that you do. Um, I have a heightened sensitivity when it comes to safety and security, particularly because years ago when there was an active shooter on Florida Atlantic University's campus, I was the only administrator of record on the Palm Beach 
State College campus, and I remember experiencing that lockdown. Um, and at the time, we had about three or 4,000 students on our campus at that time. So I empathize and I, I totally get it. The communication piece is absolutely critical because it became an issue of whose jurisdiction. Luckily, we had a very positive relationship with FAU police and the city of Boca Raton police, so everybody worked quickly together. My point is, my, my question for you this evening is, what type of trainings um, do you all um, provide here within the school district, particularly with respect to not only the teachers but the students? Because now that I've transitioned from our Boca campus to our Palm Beach Gardens campus, um, that is something that we are constantly challenged with trying to find ways to appropriately train our faculty, staff, and students for those types of incidences. So that is a very good question, and again, as I said in the beginning, you know, this takes time. Well, you know, the ultimate goal is to change a culture. Yeah. And so that doesn't happen overnight. So one of the things that I had the uh, opportunity to do in my first couple of weeks here was to actually uh, meet with all of the principals and assistant principals in, in one large uh, gathering. And so um, I was able to at least do a presentation about what the strategies are, but it gave me a good opportunity to hear what their concerns are uh, in terms of these things. So um, just in the, initially as we go out, we're, we're still doing the drills that we do. We have an officer in every school. We have the um, crisis response team there, and it's officer's responsibility to ensure that communication at their particular school is occurring. And, uh, and that we're moving this process along. Um, I put this picture back up there mm -hmm. because one of the uh, medium to long-term goals uh, that I have is we're restructuring our uh, training division right now mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if I, in the past, we, we had four officers that were training all of the school district police, all of the district staff, mm -hmm. all of the schools, um, you know, and so that's a little challenging. So we're restructuring now so that we can address internal training, external training, uh, and actually get out to the field so that we can evaluate the way it's going in the field real time. One of the things we plan on doing when we get this system up and running here is to use that as well to simulate training for each of the schools and bring, bring your staff in and uh, no right or wrong answers. We want to get you conditioned to think along the way. So hopefully down the road, I'm going to be able to change that culture. In the meantime, we're leveraging things like um, working on that software system to get the in teacher's information regarding to the reunification evacuation process. It's not lost on me that uh, being a teacher is hard enough. Being a teacher when you're in a, an environment where there's a code red and you're in that classroom and the lights are off and the shades are drawn that yeah. every second is like minutes and every minute like hours and every hour like days it's not lost on me um, i'm working as diligently as i can to to uh, to be able to improve our situation mm -hmm. he's being very humble um just his first meeting with the principals and assistant principals he talked a lot about he is shifting the culture the whole concept of i am safety people kind of chuckled at first but people are have caught on to that he also packaged training materials for principals to take back to their staff to use during preschool week. Schools had to set aside a half a day of training around a lot of these resources, <clears throat> as well as a lot of that was lifted, depending on the audience at the grade level, um, to work with the kids as well. So the whole concept of IM safety, training the kids about that. Mm -hmm. The culture has begun to shift, so he's being very humble on that aspect. Um, and again, we've asked the schools again for next year that on an annual basis is what uh, to set aside a half, say, half, half a day of preschool towards school safety. So again, we'll continue to update, provide additional resources working together. I think so, that's tremendous, particularly because <clears throat> a lot of people did not realize the details that went into um, being prepared on that day until they actually experienced it. And then the simple things like knowing that you need to pull the shade, knowing that not everybody could be on their cell phones because a person walking by can see that your cell phone is lit and, and that everybody has 
to play a role in each other's safety. That's That's been like the biggest push that I've been pushing out there on our campus that, that being responsible for others' safety is a non-negotiable concept. That's a great way to put that. So I like, I like that theme. I mean, all the way down to, you know, making sure that staff understand that, you know, picking up a, a lockdown key is not something that is optional. That's something that is mandatory if you're going to be working here. It can make the difference between your life, but also the lives of the 36 students that are in your class. Well said. Great I point. I love it. I am safety. I love that. <laughs> Careful, he might hire you. <laughs> I have a question about after school activities. Yes. Is there a gap? Because this whole presentation is during school hours, early to the what happens after school? Is there a gap? Is there are is there a special task force force on that? So um, one of the things that we're working on right now that, um, well, let me back up. Currently, it's, um, it's as the need arises, we'll shift the resources. We're constantly shifting resources around all day long. Same thing in the evenings and stuff to cover the most significant pieces of security. Um, what uh, we envision happening down the road is that through the hiring process, especially now that the referendum is passed, that we'll be able to enhance our uh, presence on the campus uh, every day to encompass the life of that campus. So whatever's happening in the, during the day, after school, practice, you know, events, and then manage the ebb and flow of officers there. But right so, now it, it, it isn't in effect because the high schools, my God, I mean, they're <laughs> constantly, constantly uh, busy with teams. Football was over, then basketball began, and... So um, that's really a great point. So we have very strong uh, operational plans. Every time there's a, uh, a significant event on a high school pre-planned, we have to, the district commander and officer is required to put together an operations plan that outlines a number of things. I don't want to get into all the particulars because I don't want to give away our security plans, but every event has an operations or a security plan, okay? Now, the other thing that we do that's really important is, let's say, um, let's say you're in Boca, okay, and you have a sporting event where the, uh, the team is coming from Jupiter. Well, we make sure that the Jupiter student, the, the team that's going to Boca, is given a safety briefing, they understand uh, the layout in Boca, they understand what to do if there's an emergency, and their police, their school-based police officer will go with them, you know, provided we can make that work on a schedule. So on those events, we're covered pretty well. The challenge we have is for when the after-school uh, things happen that aren't big events. So consequently, you know, we work very closely with Keith's uh, uh, folks and so we may have to move two or three piece, people over to Boca today and then after that they're going over to Del Rey and then they're uh, you know we're moving them back and forth right now I want to get out of that business long term I want them on the campus and so we're working through that it's a big issue we have made, made significant changes to our protocols particularly to the gymnasium similar to that of the football stadium that the clear bags no re-entries those kind of concepts, we've gotten, I think, zero pushback from the community, very, very little. Um, but those are becoming very standard as a way we operate, which has really helped out a lot um, right. for our officers, our school-based administrators. When we have a large a number of people in a concentrated small area, Okay. So, and then one other thing I'll add to that. So, you know, <clears throat> there, again, the importance of relationships. Uh, I can't. You know, I, I can't say enough about it. So if we're having, we need extra patrols at a school or something after hours, we can get with the local uh, PD or sheriff's office, and they'll do that for us in a heartbeat. And we do it, it's a constant flow of information. We do it all, we talk to each other every day. To, to follow up on Sandy's and also Charmaine's questions, um, there, I've got a couple. But the first one to follow up with Sandy. So you, you, 
she's referencing after school activities and you've talked about big events and the gymnasium, but what about for those after school clubs mm -hmm. or the fact that the campuses are, as I think you mentioned, completely wide open and available where during the school day from let's say first through sixth period, there's only one entry, but come seventh period, there are multiple entries and then the campus is open. So how is that being looked at? So I'm, I'm not gonna get in the particulars of That's how that fine. works. Um, I could tell you when we get to those seventh period times and the campus starts to open so that we can allow for the exit, the, the people coming in and getting people up, the security measures change. Okay. So uh, same thing, um, you know, like we're, when we're managing a large scale event, as we get towards the end of the event, Mm -hmm. uh, the security measures change in anticipation of uh, more movement and people coming back and forth on the campus. So answer to the smaller question, that's still one of those things that, you know, we are working to get people on the campus for, throughout the life of the campus. So, but I just want to share something with you about security. Security can go on and on and on. Um, you know, because then we're going to get to bus stops and then we're going to get to a number of different things. Um, if any of you have ever heard of the DC Beltway snipers that were killing all those people, I commanded a task force for the investigation and the prosecution of those. And I will never forget what was written on one of the notes that they pinned to a tree after they shot somebody. They made all these demands and on the last thing was a postscript that said, P.S. Your children are not safe anywhere, anytime. So it was left to us to figure out how to protect them. Mm -hmm. So do you protect them during the day at school? Do you protect them after school? Do you protect them at the playground? Do you protect the walkers? Do you protect those at the bus stops? Do you get, you know, it, it's, it can go on and on. And so as a, as a community, we have to all work together to enhance our abilities to be able to protect these kids. So I hear what you're saying. But we've been, we definitely have tightened up on our protocols in after school time, whether it's elementary or the secondary, locked doors. So there's a lot of other protocols that have been in place, but really worked on fidelity. Mm -hmm. So the, the other question um, is, as the follow-up is, with the higher instances of reports of guns on campus, which I, I understand and appreciate that they're now officers there and able to be in better communication, you've built those relationships. Um, have there been increases in other report, other crimes reported, where or have there been increases of, for example, finding drugs on campus or things like that? Well, uh, I think drugs on campus are an altogether different thing than just the safety pieces itself. So I have not seen any increases, and we have partners that we work with relating to drug distribution, um, any of those types of things. Um, so the answer to that would be no. Um, in terms of crime rates, I, I haven't looked at the crime rates recently in terms of, you know, property crimes and those type of things. In general, what, I pay, what I've been focusing on in the short period of time I've been here are the security-related concerns. So in answer to your question, I will tell you that uh, I have not seen anything uh, in any of the data that I'm looking at that would suggest to me that there's an increased risk to safety on any of our campuses. And if I do see it, we're going to take action on it. I have a question about the elementary school, after school. Uh, most elementary schools, majority, I think, have an after school child care program. And there would often be times when just the SAC director is there and the individuals that work with him or her at that. So have they gotten any kind of training? Mm -hmm. They have. Um, we pulled them in during uh, Quanta Profit, who is the director for extended learning. Uh -huh. He's had numerous trainings with them. They all had to have their own safety plan as well to ensure um, that they had protocols depending on the layout of their school, where their checkout was, et cetera, was in place. So yes, and it's ongoing. Okay, that was gonna be my next yeah. question, okay. Okay, great questions. Anybody have anything else? Okay. Thank you very Thank you, much Chief. for your Thank time. You very much. Thank you. Thank you so Appreciate much. It. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. I'm good. So you want to take a teacher evaluation question? 
<laughs> Jackie had a. Um, uh, Jackie, yeah. you. Okay. Question that Keith probably does not want. <laughs> that I don't want to answer. That. Um, okay. Well, before we do that, I'm being asked that we actually um, take a look at the minutes from last time, since we now have a quorum. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Wait, before somebody leaves. I am quorum. Yes. Um, the, the in the minutes it doesn't include the questions that are committee had asked um, or in it it didn't in our discussions about um, the equity and distribution of uh, course selections across the county that we had a, dis a discussion about and so could that be amended into these minutes okay Um, so I don't, it might be easier to approve these once we have that language in front of us. So if we can, I guess, table this until next time, that might work out better. Okay, great. So now Jackie, you're up. Okay. Um, uh, Keith, the whole situation about the evaluation of teachers and those teachers who are basically in the lower performing schools, uh, generally speaking, having, um, less, fewer of those teachers getting an above expectation or whatever you're calling it now on your evaluations as compared to teachers who are teaching at other high income schools. So what is the district, I know that you had made, at least it was reported, uh, comments regarding, hey, maybe some of the principals need additional training. Um, can you tell us where the district is with that whole situation? Yeah, so for the record, I talked to the reporter for probably close to an hour. Uh -huh. um, and <laughs> My comments were, you know, pulled out of context. Mm -hmm. So, and I did talk to some of the principals uh, about that. I guess that's the risk that happens when you talk to reporters. Um, so, let me just back up. The issue in this particular article, if you didn't read it, about teacher evaluation, mm -hmm. if you didn't, then you missed the front page, um, actually got into an issue that we actually brought that issue here. We all saw the data. Remember, there's three components to a teacher evaluation. There's student performance, which based off last year's uh, was a third of the evaluation. There was the uh, student, or the teacher's objective, their personal goal. Um, why am I going to start? What's the name of the Professional name? growth plan. Professional yeah. growth. Yeah, which was last year was 10%. And then the third part, which was 57% was the, um, instructional practice so how a administrator rates a particular teacher and marks them based off Marzano so the variance that we saw in our district here was that we had some schools where the school-based administrators had no teachers rated highly effective and you get four categories you could be rated highly effective effective needs improvement I'm sorry developing or needs improvement um, under each of those categories. So under instructional practice, we had some of our schools where no teachers were rated um, highly effective under instructional practice, and some schools where everybody was rated highly effective and everywhere in between. So it was a big hill. So which spoke to a lot of the issues that we talked about here, flawed system, difficult to get um, fidelity around this process. Particularly the article was framing that uh, a number of the schools, most the majority of the schools where nobody was rated highly effective were some of our highest uh, Title I schools. Some of those schools actually made very strong gains. Um, one of the schools went up two letter grades. So it was the concern of how comes no one's rated highly effective. So it was, let me get you on my record. Um, <laughs> so it was, it, it, it's, it's a difficult issue. I've been very transparent with the principals that I had concerns. On both ends, I have concerns where everybody's rated highly effective on instructional practice, oh. that there's a problem there and there's coaching that needs to be done there because if you've got a perfect staff and everybody's highly effective, in particular with instructional practice, then your student achievement should reflect such. Um, also, I have a concern, um, if anything, I empathize and have more concerns where nobody's rated highly effective that 
you know, for whatever reasons, the administrator has nobody highly effective. Um, be in the bigger picture in a flawed system, those schools are going to have a very challenging time in recruiting, retaining exactly. teachers. And I've made that very clear in talking to those principals that, um, unfortunately, it's just the situation that we're in. What's changed and what we presented here, we moved to a third, third, third of each of those three components. We reduced the number of elements on the Marzano. We, we um, changed the whole teacher map of how teachers are scored from 59 down to 23 elements. Um, everybody got training from teachers to administrators on this new map, um, reducing the variance, um, and we're putting regular progress monitoring to let schools know what their, um, what their scores look like. The biggest piece that plays into this and why this is so important is this is tied to money. A highly effective a total evaluation based on all three components puts a lot more dollars in your pocket from best and brightest, which is, it could be uh, up to $6,000, was it, I think, last year, Brian? I think like it that. is. It's going up to nine. And going up to nine. And then um, as well as our own difference in pay here locally uh, based on the statute that you had to make more if you could get highly effective versus effective, so on. Um, so this is money in teachers' pockets. Um, just read recently, a couple weeks ago, New York, they actually got rid of this whole, a lot of states went to this type of a model. New York actually got rid of it, um, the adding student achievement as part of a teacher evaluation process. Um, we have that, plus we have the pay for performance. I can tell you the governor is looking at teacher evaluation. He's looking at best and brightest. He's looking at all these pieces um, in this session. We'll see how that plays out. But we think the changes that we've made, we've already seen significant changes where we're at at this point. Uh, principals are able to see how their scores are playing out uh, so that we hopefully will not see this kind of variance that exists. The variance that we see here amongst our schools, we see the same across the entire state. For the last couple of years, we will have some districts where every teacher is highly effective um, by design to where some very few are and everywhere in between. So, um, but we're hopeful that uh, the, the significant changes, we worked very closely with the teachers union on the changes that were made for this year that we'll see some positive. Um, so everyone uh, is having some accountability, not just the schools where, as you mentioned, where <laughs> Uh, no students, I mean, no teachers, or very few teachers were hate, uh, rated highly effective in those which everybody. The principal rate. supervisors so those, for those, those for work, Those principals yes. have to be held accountable Absolutely. to what it is that they're doing also. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was concerned about the morale also, the impact of morale at those schools where students' achievement level has risen, but yet no one received a highly effective. And so that, that automatically trickles down to the students when teacher morale is low. Sure. I, I have the same concerns. And so we are working closely with the, the regional superintendents, the instructional superintendents, um, around the coaching and feedback for those principals and assistant principals on that campus mm -hmm. uh, to get through this process and this change, you know, having conversations and transparent conversations. Um, with their staff to let them know that they are addressing this that you know um and then again to the whole point around training you know i assume how, how we, you're scoring i assume sheets. we'll have an update on that sometime this year uh where we could discuss this in depth not in two or three minutes yes. we've spent a couple of meetings on this particular topic last year but i'm just saying it, it's a it's a new approach. It's a new feel now. That's what I'm hoping for. That's what I'm betting on. <laughs> yes, we're very confident so, that the changes will be positive for for all schools. Nancy, and then Carlos, and then me. Um, the other thing I think that's important to mention is um, for a teacher to be rated as highly effective on a specific element, a hundred percent of the students had to meet the desired effect. Now that's a lower percentage, which makes it more realistic for teachers. So it's 90% or 95%. Yeah, there's a lot of nuances like that that make people have a hard time understanding and trying to explain this to a reporter. 
makes it difficult. Carlos? Uh, just a question. Uh, what happened to those principles that rated everyone highly effective or no one highly effective? Were any of them rated highly effective? <laughs> because if we're talking about accountability, you know, I'm a big believer in accountability, but I do believe accountability has to be transparent and cut both ways. Absolutely. So what happened to the administrators that obviously did not pursue an evaluation system with fidelity? And that's being handled administratively. Okay, but it is being handled. Yes. <laughs> it has not been lost. <laughs> so will their evaluations change or not? If, if, if no one at their school got a highly effective, okay, but the principal did, that principal will continue to have the highly effective? Let me be clear, where nobody, what was in the paper was highly effective in instructional practice. You could have been effective on our instructional practice and because of the student achievement, still been rated highly effective. Many of those particular teachers Overall evaluations were still highly effective. Not all, but some were. What they were printing was in particular just around instructional practice. Their student achievement was enough to push them to highly effective. But when a principal rates every teacher highly effective, or no teacher is highly effective, that's tantamount to university professor taking all of the papers and give everybody an F or everybody a, a, an A. In other I words, it, the, the, the business of evaluation, why. which is to discriminate according to valid criteria, simply did not take place. Mm -hmm. And evaluation or sound evaluation is one of the principal's major responsibilities. And it has been dealt with, and it has been dealt with and continued to work on. Thank you. And I just want to say that at the very back of your folder is some information about BAM, which is a festival of books and music in downtown West Palm Beach on March 4th. You can come and see Keith. He's going to be one of our panel moderators. We have some March fabulous. 2nd. Hmm? Not Mar March 4th. No, March 2nd. What is this? You said it? March 4th. Oh, did I? No, I'm sorry. Um, but it's exciting, and we have lots of wonderful authors coming, national award winners. So we're thrilled and if you are, um, had children or you have grandchildren now, like I do, and you've ever read Good Night, Good Night Construction Site by Sherry Rinker, she's going to do a storytelling at the Brightline Station on Saturday morning. So we're excited. That's it's an amazing, amazing event. If oh, thanks to Keith. The school district has been a huge partner in this. But they used to have it up at Palm Beach Gardens High School, and moving it downtown, you can make a whole day of it. There's different. The, the city has right. been just a we great partner. We have music while well, it's up street painting this year. Um, it's exciting. And watching kids and adults talk to these authors and hearing these authors talk about their books, it's just a completely fascinating um, experience. It's, it's a free family event. Thank you. So two things. Um, one is as a follow-up, it was mentioned last week, I know you weren't here, Keith, but as a follow-up to our discussion last week, <laughs> We were talking about um, the um, AP, ACE, IB, dual enrollment classes, and the master board schedule as, and then we saw a few different uh, parts of the presentation which outlined that the principals are evaluating the participation in these courses um, by the different uh, racial ethnic groups and free reduced lunch and English language learners and ESC, et cetera. Um, so one of the questions that uh, I had asked last time was, has someone done that on a course by course analysis across the district to see, are we enrolling our students in these courses in uh, representative um, percentages of our communities versus the people participating, the students participating in the courses. So if we have 50% of our students are African Americans, or 50% of our students in AP Calc AB, are they African American? So my hope is that we can get this information because that could help. Even close. 
I, right, I'm sure not, but, <laughs> but my hope is that, that can help okay. further identify what we need to do on a course by course basis. And as I've read in the news and pushes for STEM careers and what some universities are doing to reach out to communities to help encourage minorities to participate in these careers and to be trained, this could help identify that need and then potential possible grants and programs that we need to develop to help make that happen. So I'm hoping we can get that information so by have, next month. So we have the, not by next month. What you're asking mm -hmm. by course, uh, well, when we don't have anything built like that, so well, that's, but what we do have, two months. <laughs> the data that we do have can show, does show that year after year, we continue to close that gap of access um, as well as um, performance to accelerated coursework. Right, but this is getting and to the, by race. The, well, this is but, getting to the topic within the advanced coursework. That's, that's remember, my concern. If they're ACE, AP, or IB, we can see that, yes, we've got more kids of color in those particular than we ever have. Um, do we have it by a particular course? No, but as a whole, we can tell that we've increased the number of students of color in those particular courses. We have, my, that, my, we have an equity report that we have to do every year. Okay, but my concern is, is that within the different subjects that it's not equally being pushed within the communities and you can tell that because the courses are not being consistently offered across the district. And that's why we developed so, the master board analysis, which you guys went through last time, that whole process to have those hard conversations with the school centers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we lose too many other people, sorry. Um, but I'm hoping we can get that. So for next time, uh, there were some topics that we talked about earlier in the year, possibly addressing. One was um, an update about the gifted program because there were some changes made for this year and we haven't uh, Have to hear about that. Um, and Changes. In with the equity, there were some new programs with trying to make, um, enhance the equitable access so that there were new uh, gifted programs in some schools so that there were no change, you talk about the gifted screener? Well, the, as a result of the gifted screener, there are now gifted programs in more schools, right? Or something along those lines? Yeah, I don't know if we're ready to. It's been expanded, is my point, and so to hear how the that's going. More choice has been open to parents. Okay. So they can choose, if, if it was or was not, if it was a cluster site that a school usually sent kids, and now school is opening up their own program. Parents have a choice to either send their classroom or they can stay in their home school. Still, the, the, I know that the, it's now offered in more schools available to more students. And so that, yes. just an update on the progress on how that's going and that there was gonna be work done on a, the gifted curriculum as well. And so they would yeah, be- Yeah, I think that's still a work in progress. I don't know if we have any significant updates to bring. Okay. Right Probably more in early next year for that. Okay. Um, and the different the electives that are offered at middle schools, so that there can be equ more equitable access to find out information as to what's offered where. Um, so there's more equ not counting academies, so that there's still uh, equity and access. Uh, and an update regarding elementary school report cards and the analysis of their impact on middle school performance. We just, we haven't heard an update and it's now rolled out a little bit further. All right, some of the other topics I do want to refer, um, we have uh, a new ESE and ESAW platforms that we're gonna this morning. more than likely be rolling out. Okay. That are important to bring forward. That'd be great. Um, that will have significant changes. Okay. Um, and also update on the mental health components and then where we're headed with standards. Okay. And what information we have from the governor. Does anybody else have any other ideas that they want? Carlos? Yeah, I'd like to have a better part of a meeting okay. devoted to uh, uh, the notion of teacher professional development and administrative professional development. Since 62% uh, of the kids in this district are either black or Latino. I would be interested to know what percentage of those workshops involve those topics or other topics of diversity. Um, we
we, we know from previous uh, data we've been presented that new teachers tend to come into Title I schools at about twice the rate that they come into non-Title I schools. So therefore, what is the diversity background that our new teachers have? Because they're going into the, some of the most challenging situations. Right. Secondly, is there a standard induction process district-wide to support these teachers, or does it depend on the principal and whether the principal chooses to give X or Y importance? Um, because another thing that tends to happen is those new teachers started those Title I schools and the minute that three years are up, they put in for a transfer to suburbia. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I know about research and effective education is that continuity of instruction, in addition to excellence of instruction, both contribute highly to student achievement. So what are the turnover rates in our various schools? And could those be affected by more targeted professional development? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I need to keep me thank busy. you all. Do we, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. See you next month.